Our help is in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. We want to welcome everyone this morning as we come to worship God uh, on His day, on the Lord's day. We do welcome everyone and glad you are here. A uh, couple of announcements, uh, one not in your bulletin, is that we are doing a group order for Rosario Butterfield's new book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Uh, I've almost finished it. It has been one of the more profitable books that I can, I've read in a long time, so I very much encourage you. Uh, it's a, we've got a really good deal on these books, so if you'd sign up on the bulletin board out in front of Stacy's office, um, we will make sure we can get you a book. The, um, Stacy is on vacation this week, so if you need something and you can't get anybody at the church, please call either Ethan or I, or you could call an elder or a deacon. Or you could wait till she gets back. Either way, it's all good with us. Uh, but if you need something, please just let us know and under, know that the office will be manned off and on. Lunch Bunch is meeting uh, going this Tuesday, June the 12th at 1130. We're going to be meeting at the Wagon Wheel, so that's a change in our, from our, where we've been meeting. Uh, please sign up if you would so we know how many to tell when we get there. Uh, also... Uh, ordination service for Jordan uh, Bernard. If you're interested in riding the bus, there's a sign-up sheet outside the office for that as well. That's going to be at 4 o'clock on um, June 17th at the York ARP Church. Uh, I know several people are going to be participating in it. I know David Pokopak and Buddy Lever and myself are actually in the service, So, uh, but we hope a lot of people will go to support Jordan. Tonight we'll be having our psalm sing. If you did not sign up for dinner, I'm afraid you're too late for that, but you still can come at 6.30 and sing with us and encourage everyone to do that. Also make a note that our Vacation Bible School starts next week on Monday, June the 18th. Please make a note of the other announcements in the bulletin, and let's prepare our hearts now to worship the Lord. God, we give thanks for your name is near. Let's pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in awe and in wonder of who you are, in awe and wonder of the things that you have created. Lord, we thank you for what you have done for us in blessing us with this church, in blessing us with this location, in blessing us with the ability to attend each and every Sunday morning. Father, we thank you for all that you have done, your provisions for us from day to day. And Lord, we thank you most of all for Christ. We thank you for what he has done for us. And it is because of what he has done for us that we are able to pray in the same manner that he taught his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Please join together in singing. Hymn number 599, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, Hymn 599.
Let us pray to get together the prayer of confession found in your bulletins. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge that we are conceived and born in iniquity and mourn our manifold sins and wickedness, which we, from time to time, most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may hereafter serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for all of you who prayed that prayer with sincerity in your heart, hear the assurance of pardon from Psalm 91. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Please stand. Thank you for the ability to give of what you have given to us. And Lord, we pray that as we give, that you will bless these tithes and these offerings, that you will use them for your glory, for the expansion of your kingdom here in Lancaster and around the world. Pray that you will bless them, Lord. For in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Be seated.
morning comes from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, questions 4, 5, and 6. And I will read the question if you will read the response in bold. Good Christian, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Are there more gods than one? There is but one only, the living and true God. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same as us, equal in power and glory. Well, now we will sing our psalm. If you will turn over to Psalm 69D in the blue ARP Psalter, Psalm 69D. be seated. Our New Testament scripture reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 through 14. Hear the reading of God's word. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, And in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. That sends the reading of God's holy word. Father and our God, we come before you on this, your Lord's day. 
the day in which we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord from the dead, your victory over death and sin, and the hope and the surety of our salvation and our place that you have prepared for us as you have promised in the gospel. Father, we come and we give praise to you that you are the one true and living God. And we are here in your presence, that we are united to you in your death and resurrection, that we are your people, and that you love us and that you care for us, and you now call on us to lift our hearts together, to lift our voice together before your throne, both in praise and telling you what we need. Father, I pray, thanking you for a synod meeting that went well this week, for the unity that you brought to your people, for the hope that is for the church. We pray, Father, that our unity would bring prosperity. As your spirit has brought unity, your spirit will bring prosperity to the church, both in our knowledge as we grow together in who you are and what you are, as we learn how to live in the light of your gospel and your grace, as we reach out to a community, to the communities where your churches are represented, where our church is represented. Father, bring prosperity and give us peace and give us unity and bless us. Father, we come and we are thankful for answered prayer for the sick, for the needy, Father, we are thankful that you have us here and that you've brought us together. We're thankful for our dinners for eight that allow us to know one another. We are thankful for our dinner tonight that lets us spend time together and learn better to sing the songs that you wrote. And Father, help us to appreciate the song, for it is the greatest hymn book we have. For you wrote it and you teach us through it. Father, we come and we lift up our prayers. Father, I lift up my prayers for Karen and one of her friends who is being transferred to another house. I know that's deep in her heart. And Father, we pray for our friendship class and we pray as they have been, several of them moved around in the last few years. Father, we pray your grace and peace upon them. Bless this one that's moving. Bless Karen and Bobby and their friends. Father, we are thankful for Camp Joy that just ended, and we know there's many other sessions this summer of Camp Joy coming up, and we pray that you would bless Camp Joy, bless the opportunity that it gives to special needs folks to have a week in the mountains and to enjoy camp and to learn about Christ. We thank you for that opportunity, and we thank you we support that, and we pray, Father, that you would bless these camps. Father, we come and we lift up our nation. We pray for our president, we pray for, the, for our congressmen, our senators, for our state leaders, our local leaders. Father, we have an election this coming Tuesday, a primary election for our state. And Father, we pray that you would bless these that you've called to lead, that you would lead us and bring forth our new leaders that would be a blessing to us. Father, we pray that they would know Christ and follow Christ and bless us through Christ. Father, we come and we pray for our world. We pray that you would help us to be light. Help us to not have hatred or pride. Help us not to look down on others. Help us to see that except for the grace of God, there go we. And may our hearts be broken. And may we see the need. May we see those around us who do not know you. May we see where they stand, that they stand above the pits of hell. And the only thing that can save them is your grace and your gospel, a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Father, may that motivate us to go forth and share the gospel, trusting you for the result. Father, we come and we pray for each other. And we pray for the battles that we each fight, some known, some unknown, some medical, some emotional, some spiritual. Father, bless your people. Bless your people through Jesus Christ. Draw us together through Christ and hold us together through Christ and keep us together through Christ.
Father, bless us as we go forward. Father, we pray for Andrew Bronson. Father, we lift him up as he sits in prison still. We thank you that you have upheld him and will continue to do so. Be with his wife, Noreen. Be with his family. Father, we do pray our heart's desire that he would be released. Hear our prayer. Father, we pray that you would continue to bless our little church here. May we depend upon you. May we trust in your word. May we grow in your word. And may we not be satisfied with where we are now. But may we long to know you and your word and worship you more and more. Father, bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I think at this point, if the children would come forward for the children's sermon. If there are any children, unless they've all gone on vacation. There's a few over there. Good. I knew a bunch were gone today. Well, we got some good ones. Good. How are you all? Now, this is going to surprise y'all. You know how, I old, how old I was before we had the first computer in our house? How old do you think I was? Do you think I was two? How old do you think I am? Three? Four? I was 12. I was 12 years old before we had a personal computer. And the personal, that personal computer... Your watch, if you have a watch, had more memory in it than that computer. It was 16K. You know what that means? I ha when I open a Word document or a Pages document in my Mac, and, it, and I look and see the blank document has more Ks than my first computer does. Okay? It's crazy. But you know, what we learned, we learned a lot of basics about computers. And computers all come down to two numbers. Do you know what they're called? Do you know what the two numbers are? Zero and one. Zero and one. Right, Ira? Zero and one. Ira's a computer guy. Zero and one. Even the computers today that have a terabyte, which is huge, right? It all comes back to zero or one. It's called binary. It's either one or the other. There is no third number, right? So it uses these codes of ones and zeros and ones and zeros and lots and lots of them. And that's how it, it all works. Now, I don't know much more than that. Somebody else might. But it all comes down to ones and zeros, okay? Either it's a one or it's a zero. Well, Christianity is a lot like that. You either are a Christian or you're not. There's no middle ground. It's either you are a Christian or you're not a Christian. The middle ground doesn't exist. There's not a sort of Christian. Either you are or you're not. And when we talk about that, we're going to talk about that in the, in the big person sermon. And it's kind of important to realize that because some people can say, well, I'm, I think I'm okay with God. Well, you either are or you're not. And that's a question y'all are all old enough to start thinking about and asking and talking to me and your parents and the elders and whoever about is what does it mean be a Christian. And am I one? Okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for computers that do wonderful things. But Father, we thank you that you're more powerful than any computer and all the computers even put together. For there's nothing like you. And Father, we pray that these young people would know that we pray that they would be yours. So help them to know that there's only your two choices. Either we are or we're not. And may that help them come to understand what you've done and how we are saved and what Christ means to us. For we come in his name and we pray it. Amen. come to Psalm 14. We're doing our summer in the Psalms again. 
So if you would turn there, Psalm 14, uh, one commentator described it um, as a kind of like a Heinz 57 dog. You know what that is, right? Kind of a little bit of everything. And that's what we see here in Psalm 14 is it doesn't fit our kind of characteristics. It's not a psalm of lament or a psalm of praise or a psalm. It's a little bit of everything rolled into one. And as he put it, what do you do with a mongrel dog or a Heinz 57 dog? You love it. So let's love Psalm 50, Psalm 40. <sighs> psalm 14. Let's love Psalm 14 as uh, we uh, hear it this morning. Let us pray first. Father in heaven, we thank you for the psalms. We thank you that we can sing them. We thank you that we can know them. We thank you that they contain, as Calvin said, all the emotions of the human heart and how needed that is. They are not cold, but they are warm. They, they meet us in our pain. They meet us in our hurt. They meet us in our joy. They meet us in our sorrow. They meet us in our love. We're thankful for this psalm this morning. And we pray, Father, that you would open the ears of your people, that they may hear and believe and profit from the psalm. Open the mouth of your servant that he might preach your word. And that all of this would be for your glory. Bless us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's hear God's word. Psalm 14, beginning with verse 1. To the choir master of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. There's a binary nature of religion in the world. It's amazing that computers, as I said in the children's sermon, that computers can do so much. That they calculate, they compile, they're, they're sophisticated, they're, they're, they're incredible, aren't they? Now, you know, some of us who are older, you know, we've kind of been lulled to sleep. Go back to 1980 and then jump to here today. Wouldn't we say, wow? Just wow at what we carry in our pockets. How much more powerful they were than in our personal computers. Look back at the games that we played that some of us who are in our <coughs> 40s uh, and maybe 50s, but you played those old games, those old Atari games that had the big blocks, right? And now Spencer was playing an NBA game the other, a couple, this is few months ago and I walked in and said who's playing and he looked at me with that Spencer look of come on dad it's a game but it looked real it sounded real it's amazing and what's even more amazing is it's still just zeros and ones bits bytes K's terabytes it all comes back down to zero or one 
You see, all in the world are like this. We see this in Psalm 14 in part. Either we are ungodly, either we're apart from God, or we're saved, we're his people. Psalm 14 speaks to this. Well, the first thing we see, and I want to quote my first point I quote from Paul. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This you should know from Paul from Romans 3. But did you know that in Romans 3, he quotes Psalm 14, 1 through 3. To make the point that all are ungodly, that all have done these things. Now let's look at this. The fool says in his heart, one commentator said that there's a bit of practical atheism in every sin. That every time we intentionally sin, we are saying in our hearts, there is no God. We look here and we see the ungodly. We see in them corruption abomination, no one doing good. And we see that binary ungodliness that comes from here. The fool says in his heart, we could say a lot about this. What we do often is we say, well, those are those people, you know, those people who aren't here on a Sunday morning. And there's some truth to that, right? The danger here, though, is that we think this is really written to Israel. So that the fools he's speaking of are the people of God who speak with their lips, act with their hands, but in their heart act as if there is no God. The fool says in his heart there is no God. The actions of these people are corrupt, abominable. They do no good. And it says here that the Lord sees this. The Lord looks down. This is not just simply the Lord's walking along kind of like this. The Lord is looking. He is searching. It is the idea of as if he looks out a window to see what is happening. He looks down upon the earth. He looks here in Lancaster. He looks across all of the earth. And he sees and he knows the hearts of people to see if any seeks after him, if there are any who understand. And he gives this in verse 3, but there are none. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Sort of like the idea of the great Greek philosopher who went out with a lantern by day and night. And they said, why do you have this lantern? And they're like, we're trying to find a good man. One good man. And he couldn't do it. And so the Lord does not see one good. And again, it's easy to think this is of the people in the world. But this was Israel. And not only Israel, it can be us. Dale Ralph Davis wrote a commentary on this psalm. Let me read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. If you have your Bibles, turn there. This is a passage that we need to know. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 Ralph Davis said when he was a pastor, he would often read this as a call to worship or as an opening to worship. And I want you to think about the, the significance of these words as we come together, as we come together to worship God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual and moral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice sexual homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, 
You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Think about those words as we come into worship. You see what he did there, right? He's saying, this is who you were. You're not special. You weren't called here because you were perfect, that you were better than everyone else. We were called out of this world. We were called out of the world of fools. We were ourselves fools. And God has called us out of this world. Otherwise, this would be who we are. There would be no hope. How do we know that? We'll see that in a minute. But before we go there, let me ask you this. Have any of you ever given your testimony? Now, that's not much of a Presbyterian thing it used to be. But usually we don't like to get involved, right? We have, unfortunately, we have come to the point where we don't talk about sex or politics or religion, right? Because polite people don't do that. And as Presbyterians, we're polite people. Well, we, we've pretty much gotten over talking about politics because we can't avoid that today. Pretty much gotten over talking about sex. We need to talk about religion. And we need to be able to share our religion. We need to be able to come together and have a dinner or have a, or a dinner for eight and not just talk about the things of this world, but share our life in Christ together to give our testimony, maybe not in the formal sense in front of everyone, but to talk a little bit about what Christ means to you. Where does that start? It starts with what we see here at the beginning of Psalm 14. It starts saying, this is who I was. I was a fool. I didn't do anything right. I was corrupt and my works were abominable. And I didn't understand it. And I didn't seek God. But God sought me. Sin needs to be a part of your testimony. You need to see that. You need to see that you were a sinner like we saw with Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. This is, and some of these you were. They were sinners saved by grace. You see, you can't understand Christ until you understand sin. Christ makes no sense to you. The cross makes no sense to you until you see your sin and what it deserves. Amazing grace is just a sentimental song unless you understand sin. Until you see the depth of your need and worthlessness. Until you see the place where your sin put you. And when you see that, you see Jesus and all that he has done for you, and you sing amazing grace because you've known amazing grace. You know that you have been saved in spite of who you are. The second thing we see, these fools, these people who are not righteous, they're not neutral. They come against God's people. The psalmist says, have they no evil, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread? I don't know about you, it's pretty e easy to eat bread, right? Unless you're gluten-free, and even then you want to eat bread. But bread is something we enjoy. There's something about it where it tastes good to us. There's probably somebody saying, I don't like bread. Well, you're the oddball here, okay? Because um, we like bread. And the diets today tell us not to eat bread. It's easy to eat bread. And so when he says here, who eat up my people as they eat bread, means it's real easy. They don't think anything about it. They just do it. And we see that all over, do we not? Christians persecuted. I read of an African nation that just changed their laws to make them stricter so that if anyone converts from Islam to Christianity, it means death. There's no chance of repentance, no chance of change, nothing. It means death. In the USA, we saw a business this week in Indiana and in Alabama. They were forced to close because they refused to participate in a gay pride day 
presentation or, or promotion of that chain. We see that the, ener the energies of our, the enemies of our God are becoming emboldened. And we are called bigots for standing with God in his word. Though we who hold to the Bible and act biblically stand against such discrimination. Time is coming for those who persecute the church, though. Those who come against God's people. He said, there, was, they, there they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the, law, but the Lord is his refuge. See, a time is coming because God is with us. God is our shepherd. We may be helpless like sheep in this world, but our God is with us as our shepherd, and when he comes, our enemies will be in terror. It's good to grow up on a farm, or at least a small farm like I did in Easley. My parents worked, but we had farm. We had cows, chickens, goats, pigs, horses, ducks, geese. 40 cats. Um, I guess that counts as a farm. But you see things, and you understand things. And one of the things that happened when I was a small boy is that we had a pack of wild dogs. I learned very quickly that dogs, even domestic dogs, when they gang up and run together, they become wild and very dangerous. And at one point, we had a pack of dogs that were coming around, and they had killed one of our calves, and they were endangering other calves. And these calves were, they were sitting ducks. Our pasture was small. The dogs got them. They were going to kill them. They were helpless. But one day, the dogs showed up when my granddaddy was there with his rifle. My grandfather was a veteran of World War II, a rifleman, carried a BAR. Some of you veterans might know that. And I saw something in my granddad I'd never seen before. Because I remember hollering out, granddaddy, there's the dog right there. He was running about 100 yards full run, and my granddaddy in half a second took that rifle and went boom and dropped that dog. That dog knew terror, it knew death, and that will be what happens to those who eat up God's people. Though this life is hard, please hear me say this, being a Christian is not going to be easy. It never has been. Going forward, it will not be easy. But those who persecute, those who laugh, those who say that we are fools for believing in God, what terror they will be when they meet the living and awesome God. Because God is with his people, and God shepherds his people. And the pain of God's people, God says, are his pains in Isaiah We need to train up our children to know this. We need to train up our children to know the living God so that then when they are persecuted, when they're attacked, we need to be training ourselves, young Christians, old Christians, we need to be training ourselves to know that God is with his people. And though we seem helpless against this world, they will be in terror when they meet the living God. The third thing we see is that salvation has come out of Israel and that it is Christ. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortune of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Salvation has come out of Israel. The Old Testament saints, they were ever looking forward. They lived in signs and shadows of sacrifices and ceremonies pointing to Christ, pointing to the Messiah, believing by faith in God that he would send his son, that he would send the one who would take away the sin and restore his people. Here was their faith. Here was their hope. Here was their justification. If we look at Galatians 3, 5 through 9, we see this clearly. In the story of Abraham. Look at how Paul uses this here. Galatians 3, 5. 
Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by the work of the law or by the hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of, Israel, of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would be justified excuse me, would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. They were looking forward to the one coming. We have it. We have Christ. We have the New Testament. We have and can see what Abraham Isaac, Jacob, and David, we see what they were looking for. The veil has been pulled back. The shadows removed. The light of Christ is here among us. And here, Christ, here is the binary switch. Here is the thing that makes us go from being the one who says there is no God, the fool. Here is the one who goes, takes us away from being the ones who hate God and his people. Here is the one who takes us away from when we meet God, it being terror to one where it is now we meet our Father in heaven. Christ brings the switch. We'll look at Romans 5. Paul speaking there about our need. 5, 12 through 17. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over those who were sinning, was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of the righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Right there you see the binary, don't you? You are either Adam's or you are Christ. You're either dead through Adam's transgression or you're alive through the free gift that comes by faith in Christ. It's faith in Christ, faith alone, that transforms you, brings you from the zero to the one, brings you from a fool to a son or a daughter, brings you from death to life, brings you from separation from God into the very presence of God. How? There's only one way. Faith in Christ. You see, you either have nothing or you have everything. We talked about this in Sunday school today. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're a Christian, you have everything Billy Graham had because you have Christ. And if you are not a Christian, then you have nothing at all. Why do you think people die for Christianity? Why are there martyrs? Why do they sacrifice for Christ and his church? Why do people pick up their lives and move to strange and foreign lands that they might tell people about Christ? Why do we do what we do if it's not for Christ? Because we have seen that we owe all things to Christ. That here is our hope and here is the hope of the world. Why do you older folks on a cold winter's day wrap up 
and come to church? Why do you older folks on a day you shouldn't come out when it's 100 degrees and 100% humidity come to church? Because you can't help but come because this is where Christ is meeting with his people. And you long to worship with Christ and to be with his people. And nothing is more important. Why do we cancel church when it snows? Do you know this? We cancel it because, not because you can't get here. We often cancel it because we don't want the older people who will be the ones who try to get here falling and breaking a hip. Because they're going to come to church. Not because it was just ingrained in them. I hope not. I don't think it is. I think it's because they see all that Christ has done for them. They see that Christ has saved them from their sin, saved them from these people described in one, verses 1 through 3. And now they are Jacob and they are Israel and they want to rejoice and they want to be glad and they want to be with God's people and worship the risen Christ. Well, Ralph David did call this a, a mongrel psalm. A Heinz 57. It's a bit all over the place. But Christian, see who you were before you were a Christian. See who you were before Christ. See that you were a fool. See that your shepherd is with you. And that you are righteous in Christ. Know that those who persecute us, who torture us, who just pick on us, that one day they will be in terror as they meet the Lord. See your salvation and rejoice and be glad. For non-Christians, remember it's binary. Either you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. If you're a Christian, that is for you. If you're not a Christian, this is for you. See that binary nature. There is no halfway you're either God's or you're not. You're either the fool or you're not. Maybe your lips and your outward life proclaims Christ. But your heart acts as if he is not real. And out of your heart flows corrupt deeds. The Lord looks. He is peering into your heart and your soul even now. And he knows he knows. Turn and see the Savior that is for you. Will you turn and believe on Christ? Salvation has come out of Israel for the whole world. Salvation has come out of Israel for you. It's binary. Which will you be? Will you be the fool? Or will you be the fool that has been redeemed? See, that's the wonderful thing about grace. You could have been your whole life the description that we see in verses 1 through 4. You could say in your heart, there is no God. You can have deeds that are corrupt or abominable, doing no good. You can know that God knows that you weren't right. And you could have been persecuted and eaten up God's people like bread. You know who the Bible describes that way? Paul. But when he met the risen Christ, he went from zero to one. He went from unbelieving to believing. That is an option for all of us. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved this day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come and we thank you for your grace, mercy, and love. And Father, I pray that you, I pray that you would help us to know. Give us assurance. Show us where we have seen our sin, where we have fled from our sin, where we have clung, flung and held on to Christ. Help us to show our heart's desire to be with Christ and his people. 
help us know that we're not just doing this for cultural reasons or for family reasons or just plainly out of habit, but help us to know that we know the Lord Jesus Christ and we love him and we desire to be his and that we are not fools. Show us the works that you're doing in our lives. Show us the good works that flow from our salvation and encourage us, those of us who know Christ. But Father, for those who do not know Christ. Show them their foolishness. Show them their corruption. Show them that you see it clearly. And Father, give them a taste of the terror that they might turn and trust in Christ, that they might see in this that they are hopeless except for the hope of Christ. And may they learn, believe in him and they may, may they be transformed. And may they rejoice. And may they be glad. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing our hymn of response, which is the Red Trinity Hymn number 38, Immortal, Invisible, number 38. Let's stand and sing. As we go out, a couple of reminders. One, that we do have a psalm sing tonight. And I know if you didn't sign up for food, it's a little late for that. But we would enjoy for you to come and sing with us. There's something special about when the more people you get to sing, no matter how bad they sing, it sounds good. So come join us. Um, and we could use the work probably on our psalm singing. Those are a little new to us. Um, but as we go out, know that Christ is freely offered to you. That you don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be special enough. You don't have to be born into it. If God is calling you to be his, answer that call. Now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Amen.